Hello everyone, this is Adult Girl here with Matthew McConaughey and today we are going to be talking about the Joran the Barbarian or the story of Joran and doing a fine literary analysis in hopes that we will further understand Joran. All right, yeah, Matthew McConaughey, A-list actor here. And the, the way that we're going to be setting up the literary analysis of Joran the Barbarian and, and how it compares to Joran's self-image. And by the way, before we get started, Adult Girl is responsible for writing this entire piece. I am only here to to chat and bullshit and be a peanut gallery. So she's going to read straight through those. We'll have a little discussion between each segment. Just just imagine classical music playing right now. Because <laughs> we got to. It's going to be really classy. All right. So you go ahead and do it. Okay. Uh, so what we're going to talk about first is the composition that we see so far in Joran the Barbarian, or the story of Joran, whichever way you know it as. It literally looks like it's been ripped out of The Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell, which discusses the structures and archetypes of the hero's journey found across many cultures and areas of time. It is neither the first or the last of Joran's appropriation and pilfering of other, better content, which speaks to his innermost desires. He copies the structure to give some bones for his story and uses components of successful storytelling to give the story momentum. It features mentor-like figures in Conan and in The Village Elder, the rising conflict with the villagers being transfigured into the very trees. This is so stupid. <laughs> I know. <laughs> the very trees he has enacted violence on, and a great task in which Jor needs to fulfill to finally become the hero. Which he never does. It is the most roundabout way of becoming a hero with actually doing nothing hero like in the process. We will get to that eventually. There are unnamed villains he never actually faces, and the forces... <laughs> oh my god. There are unnamed villains he never actually faces, and the forces of magic he is unable to understand and control are used against him. It features the journey of the hero as he travels literally and symbolically towards and away from society. Despite the use of these literary devices and plot structures, this is simply a self-serving character background, a Mary Sue written solely for Joran's gratification. By analyzing Joran the Barbarian, we can further understand how Joran simultaneously desires to understand himself while completely misunderstanding who he is at his very core. Now, let's take a deep dive into Joran the Barbarian. That was very good. Do you have any thoughts you would like to add before yeah, I, we proceed into the origins? It's The character is definitely a Mary Sue. It's an unabashed Mary Sue. I forget what the male term for that is. We'll put that on the screen <laughs> because there is a guy version of yeah, a Mary Sue. Yeah, I know what you're talking yeah. about. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I don't want to discuss quite yet because I know it's going to be covered in the upcoming sections so I think I'll just I'll save those thoughts all right on to origins um, so first I'm starting off with the laundry list of names that Jorn begins his story with because these are important enough for him to list as being his parents and his grandparents or any other family members, such as an uncle named Conan the Barbarian, uh, because all of these sources are important in the way that they have impacted Joran's perception of himself. Uh, first, um, we, we go to Sheena, who is the fictional mother. Sheena is the name of the lead character from 1984's Queen of the Jungle movie and many literary and comic book adaptations. 
which are almost entirely portrayed in a highly sexual manner. At first glance, this character seems like a cross between Tarzan and Beastmaster. We'll probably put a picture or two on the screen here. Yeah, I was thinking here. That. There's plenty of pictures. Um, there's a lot of vintage pictures, too, like, because this was very old comics. We'll put the raunchiest ones up. Yeah, the, the raunchiest ones are probably a little more contemporary, but they're all pretty raunchy. Uh, then we go to Sundar. The father of Dror and the Barbarian is a Thanely... Sorry, the little buddies are screaming. <laughs> that's that's a weird thing to say without any context. <laughs> I know. <laughs> the little buddies are screaming. They might have gotten picked up on the mic, possibly. I don't know. I doubt it. I'm going to repeat that, I don't though. think anybody can hear it, but go ahead. Okay. Sundar, who is the father of Dror and the Barbarian, is a thinly veiled derivative of Thundar the Barbarian, a short-lived cartoon from 1980-1981 and fits the general timeline for Jorn's initial consumption of male power fantasy characterized in the early 1980s. Male power fantasies, I love that. Mm Mm-hmm. And, of course, we cannot forget his uncle, Conan the Barbarian, who is solely there to be the mentor to Jorn and to empower him against the per- the sorry and to empower him against the curse placed on him since birth. Would you would you mind telling us what that curse is exactly adult Oh, uh, yes. Uh, we will cover the curse um, oh, d- is later that so- on. Okay. But I'm sure many people have already read um, the story of Jorn already and so the curse is that he is perpetually unlucky and he will never be the hero um it also means that'll affect him romantically too we have jordan the barbarian who is the grandfather and threnody who is the grandmother of jordan these characters literally come together as a romantic couple in a cruel lie a caustic yarn a book from the high fantasy series the magic of xanth written by piers anthony this series began in the late 70s and persisted into the 80s. According to the Xanth Wikipedia page, Jordan was betrayed and murdered by the woman he loves, Threnody, who is actually attempting to protect him from the evil magician Yang. Oh, God, I, I got to re- no, redo that. No, that's the take. All I right. like it. <laughs> Laugh as much as you want to this Ridiculous fucking shit. <laughs> uh, both Jordan and Threnody became ghosts haunting Castle Rugna until being reanimated by Ivy 400 years later, after which they get married. Has Jordan been seemingly or unintentionally betrayed by a romantic partner or interest before? This is the first time we see where the evil magician comes from. Now, the the parallels between Joran and Chris Chan start becoming much clearer because there's not a huge amount of difference between this and Sonichu in that it is going out and taking pre-established characters to build your own story when really you could just take those characters and just take attributes from them. You could even take the majority of their attributes and then just call them something different. But So it's it's strange that he didn't even seem to bother. And, and that noticeably carries over into the, the kind of scripts that he would write for his Joran Comedy Channel, wherein it was, you know, oh, I'm this person from something... It's all references, and that's that's been brought up in, in other instances before, where it's like Joran is just a series of references, and, mm-hmm. and by virtue of making a reference, it's funny. Because oh, remember that? It, that's exactly how Chris Chan writes. You know, he he uses song lyrics and pop culture references for everything. Um, I digress. Um, Going back to Jordan the Barbarian, where we see a lot of parallels. Also, on the same wiki page, on Jordan the Barbarian, 
In their recent appearances, Jordan and Threnody seem to have a sadomasochistic relationship <laughs> relating to Jordan's ability to regenerate wounds, limbs, etc. His talent is to recover from almost any injury as long as all of the pieces of his body are close enough together. Is this where Jordan first clings to the concept of sadomasochism and weaves it into his own self-interest? Granted, he is not interested in pain himself, but shows an alarming resilience to the criticism of his own character and actions. Uh, that's the cockroach gene, kind of. I don't know, like, no matter how, m how many times this man gets criticized. It doesn't, it doesn't phase him, nor does it really seem to sink in. He, he is truly on another planet from the responses that I've seen, not just in the chat logs, but other Joran-related content. It's, I would almost think that he's crazy, like, because he, he really doesn't seem like he's, he's with us, with the rest of us. He's somewhere else in his head. The other thing that I wanted to bring up is there's two, two things. Thing one, Joran is using Threnody, a highly sexualized character who partakes in BDSM, no, to no. portray his grandmother. We don't know that she's highly sexualized. Just oh, saying, well, this uh, isn't like the that's queen. The other this character. isn't Sheena. Sheena's the highly sexualized. Yeah, and that's his mother. <laughs> That's his mom. <laughs> you know that if these were characters he discovered during an integral part of his life, which is it's pretty obvious that's the case if you sync up his age, he is probably jerked off to photographs of what he describes as his mother in his own fan films. Oh, yeah. And then his grandmother's into BDSM where they're cutting body parts off and shit. And thing two is, I suspect Joran is into low-key cock and ball torture. Boom, right? Huge, huge. You've heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. I suspect that the reason Joran's penis is so discolored... Well, his balls, you mean. The whole thing. <laughs> his dick looks like they took skin from every ethnicity and put it on one pekka. It's it's strange because for somebody who is actually very pale looking otherwise like it's it's <laughs> weird and granted like you know the skin of the penis is usually a little bit darker than the rest of the body. It is more than a few shades deeper than what you would expect for his base skin color. Well, depending on where on the penis you're talking about. But anyway, we should probably not talk too much about Jordan's penis, but I did want to bring out the fact that, the, you know, because we have some circumstantial evidence in the use of a ballpoint pen, the coloration, the fact that he's using coupons and perhaps cleaning himself with the coupons, which would be incredibly painful. I don't think we, we can substantiate if he uses the coupons to clean himself. Just that it was something he could I put down. I suppose that's fair. Yeah, but I don't it, think he's rubbing them on himself. Do you think he just rubs his hand on his pants and puts his cummy cock back in his jeans and just... just back to, I think he just walks around a little naked for a while. I think he does the Lord, to be honest. He, 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 he appears to dry. live alone, so... <laughs> Yeah, he just lets it air dry. It just drips on his floor as he's walking around. Just whatever. I'll, yeah. I'll back you. I'll fuck you, Blada. I mean, you saw that little spider web of jism, yeah. you know, connecting to his like thigh. That's that's it's it's like a wallet chain of cum. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and he's just walking around his place. Okay. All right, let's get back on track. Okay, yeah, that's yeah, all I wanted yeah. to say. I just wanted to completely derail this. It was it this. was it was a funny thing. I only included that bit because I thought that the 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 bit about the sadomasochistic relationship had a little something to do with Joran's own interest in BDSM. I think that it is 
definitely noteworthy to bring that up. Yeah, for sure. Um, and and also maybe some unhealthy ideas of how healthy relationships function. Okay, um, looking at the Wikipedia page for the plot of Cruel Lie, a caustic yarn. Uh, Princess Ivy, who is now a five-year-old in this book, asks one of Castle Rugna's ghosts to tell her how he became a ghost. Ivy uses her talent of enhancement and some caustic, cruel lie to strip off centuries of a crude grime. To improve the range and clarity of... You said crude twice. I said a crude. Oh, Sorry. To improve the range and clarity of Castle Rugna's magical tapestry. The tapestry is a woven hanging which allows anyone to view recent or historical events. The ghost, known as Jordan the Barbarian when he was alive 400 years ago, begins his story by recounting how he set off on an adventure with his horse Pook. Jordan had the magical talent of self-healing, which came in handy as he was cut, stabbed, and dismembered during his travels. In one case, a woman finds him gravely injured and hauls him to her cottage, not knowing of his talent. Jordan ends up falling in love with this woman, Threnody. Unfortunately, the evil magician Ying Yang has already claimed Threnody to be his wife and was willing to do anything to have her. Intending to keep Jordan safe from Yin Yang, Threnody makes it appear that she has betrayed Jordan. She cuts him into pieces and buries each piece in a different remote location, knowing that if the pieces were reattached, he would be able to heal himself. However, she is never able to break free of Yin Yang long enough to collect Jordan's dismembered body and eventually kills herself. Just as a quick side note, this is exactly the story of um, Osiris from Egyptian mythology, which is, I'm sure, where the author got the idea from. After hearing Jordan's story, Ivy decides to gather his body parts herself. Once placed near each other, the pieces mend together and cover back up with muscle and skin, greatly sped up due to Ivy's enhancement, Jordan is alive again, but he wants his new love, the ghost Renee, to be brought back to life again too. When Ivy and Jordan use a regenerating potion on Renee's remains, Threnody emerges from her grave. Threnody explains that her cruel lie had been done to protect Jordan. After some time, he forgives her and they get married. What was Threnody doing in her grave? That I don't know. True. That's weird. It's and it's all... also weird that there's ghost relationships. Like, they started, like, having ghost sex. Yeah, it's really bizarre. Um, and I feel like part of that kind of feeds into his weird expectation that he will have multiple relationships with women at the same time, Aha. perhaps. Aha! Um, that he can have a meaningful relationship with Threnody, but also have new love in the afterlife. Also, how is it that he could become a ghost, but also have his body come back together and he's alive again? Like, That's a, that's, that's a plot hole, yeah, for sure. Uh, but we don't need to talk about this stupid book yeah. um, any further, because we can see where Joran has gotten a lot of his writing inspiration from. Do you have anything else to say before I get into the next paragraph, nah. summing up this section? No? Nah. Okay. After looking deeper at Joran's direct multimedia influences and inspirations, it is entirely possible that Joran's name is derived from Jordan, and some of the characteristic puns and silliness from that book is extremely similar to Joran's own cringy style. This is perhaps the only license he needed to justify his level of immaturity when writing fan fiction about himself. Looking at the specific dates of these influences, they all revolve around the large amount of high fantasy barbarian media produced in the late 70s and early to late 80s. Things not mentioned, but otherwise likely inspirations, include Deathstalker, Barbarian Queen, and 
I don't know if there's any other ones you want to throw in here, perhaps. Uh, I mean, you know, there's the obvious ones. There's pretty much anything that was released between the late 70s and early 80s when there was a huge swords and sorcerers craze, yeah. I think, which followed the first Conan the Barbarian movie. Yeah. Well, I, I think the Conan the Barbarian movie kind of came out of that as well because... Did it? I, I'm not I, sure I, which the, happened Conan first, the Barbarian honestly. was in the 80s, and some of this Barbarian stuff did start in the 70s. I know? mean, and Conan was around even before that. I'm just as yeah, far technically as the big in, in book goes, form. Yeah. yeah, there's books. There's many books. But I mean, I'm sure that everybody listening knows that. So wow, wow, we. Um, and now that I'm thinking about, it, I think that Beastmaster was actually 90s. Well, no, the Beastmaster movies, the first one was early 80s. Okay, all right. And then the, the last one with, I, f- I forget, Mark something, Mark Singer was like 93. And then they did a TV, TV show. show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was thinking of. I got a few more things to add there. Make what you will about the themes prevalent in these films and ideals Joran has come to embrace about women. Comparing this to Joran's age of 48, Joran would be between the ages of 8 and 18 when he consumed most of this, which are incredibly informative years for a child's value system and adolescent sexual development. Yeah, like Deathstalker is filled with with rape and in a lot of of that sort of medieval barbarian type writing and media etc the the sexual assault is pretty normal it's normalized for sure it's just commonplace like you could even fall in love and you know based from a from a from a sexual assault and I think that to some very dark degree, that also informed Jorn's approach to women. I'm not accusing him of being a rapist. I don't think that he would like... I think at this point he probably would have raped somebody. Shit, we can't talk about any of this, can we? We could talk about this, whatever. I don't think that Jorn would like go and physically rape somebody. I think that if there was a incapacitated woman. Yeah, I would, that's exactly what I was going to say. And he, she was back at his place yeah. or vice versa. He would do some creepy shit on he her. Mu- he would definitely do something creepy yeah. for sure. He would do something fucked up to, to some degree. I'm not sure what because I think he would fear the consequences. Jordan would not do well in a in a prison setting. I, don't, I do not believe. No, no. He's a sensitive artist. He's too sensitive for that. <laughs> uh... Continuing on to origins, if you don't have anything Mm. else to say. Please continue. Okay. Moving on from the references to other characters from other forms of media, books, movies, comics, what have you, um, we have a very specific location. Now, Jorn likes to be very specific when he's literally referencing something, and When it's anything else, he just barely suggests it and doesn't even bother to give it any type of name or special treatment, such as the village elder who has no fucking name, (laughs) um, but is essential to the plot. Meanwhile, he has to list off grandparents that are not even part of this story. Yeah, the grandparents don't show up at all, do they? No, but I will explain later what this whole thing is when we get to the very end. There's a reason why he wrote this the way that he did. It's not just a straight-up story, clearly. It's explaining the character, more or less. Um, I eagerly await. Yes. Uh, The location I'd like to speak of is Lusitania. Jordan uses a very specific name for this fictional land of origin, Given his lack of detail throughout his background of Joran the Barbarian, this seems strangely superfluous at first, and appears to be made up. It is not. As we already know about Joran, he is obsessed with names and where people come from geographically and ethnically. Lusitania was the ancient Roman province 
which largely covers the area where Portugal is now oh, I remember and this. parts of Western Spain. Um, and I have a link here to like a Google search where you could include whatever picture or maybe it's a direct picture. Uh, yeah, I'll put just it on the screen. You know. Yes, so people can get a visual aid. We're all about education here at the Alpha Male Derrick Research Department. That's a very clever find with the name of the the country that they're in, the mm-hmm. land. Mm-hmm. What, what is it again? I, I Lusitania. Can't, Lusitania. I believe that's how it's pronounced. Yeah, we'll go with that. I don't think that I could do a better job. But yeah, that was definitely a clever find there. And, and makes perfect sense with the whole... Portugal thing that Joran has spoken about in the past, despite not really showing anything outside of mentioning it as far as being Portuguese or partially Portuguese. But I don't know if he is Portuguese or if he just has like a Portuguese step parent or something. I don't no, know. No, no, it's his mother. Oh, his mother's Portuguese. Okay. Yeah, she she's apparently... So he's half Portuguese. I don't know. I, I don't know exactly the her own background. Percentage of Portuguese. Yeah, Portuguese. but apparently, um, she lived there at some point. Okay. Um, that's what somebody had told me before. It's just not super clear, but he clearly has this attachment to it. It's very important to him, just like another certain individual that we know is very, very. Into Ruckersville, Virginia. Yeah, is very proud of being from Ruckersville, Virginia, or or lives there, I should say. Ruckersville represent. Yeah. So now that we have a little context for the origins of Lusitania, um, let's also remind ourselves a little bit of Roman history. So historically, as the Romans had advanced through Western and northern parts of Europe to further expand their ever-growing empire, the native peoples were known as names synonymous with warriors, pirates, and barbarians, such as the Gauls, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Franks, and so on. Jordan likely attributed this to the native peoples of the Iberian Peninsula and likewise thought of them as barbarians in the most literal sense of the word. Even looking at the etymology of the word Lusitania reveals something about Jorn's interpretation of its ancient peoples, despite multiple sources being unclear if it came from Celtic influence or if it is derived from Greco-Roman origins. Looking at the latter rewards many parallels to Jorn's idealized Mary Sue. So we have Lucis forming the first part of it and it is translated as game or play and it is considered to be the name of the founding figure of the Lusitania province. He's also considered to be a companion or in some cases the son of Bacchus slash Dionysus, the infamous Greek slash Roman god of debauchery and wine. Isn't it Dionysus? If we're pronouncing it wrong, just tell us. Just yell at us in the comments. Oh, yeah, Greek words. We'll we'll redo the whole video. And so on the screen here, you're gonna see um, a website where this information comes up from. And I don't think it's a coincidence that it came up while I was doing my research on the origins of Lusitania and its origin words, such as losis. I believe I'm pronouncing that right, Lucis, Lusis. Um, Jorn had a project with his comedy troupe that was called (laughs) Please, and I don't think that's a coincidence. And I would be, I would love to know if he came up with that name or if it was actually one of his comedy troupe members, and it's just a huge coincidence. But I am positive he's researched this, um, because his own idealized image of himself seems to be heavily rooted in these words as we continue on. I love it. Bacchus is also known for his group of ardent female followers called the Bacantes. Starting to see some themes developing here? 
Ironically, when referenced by the Merriam-Webster definition, and perhaps a more modern meaning of the word, lucis is defined as a deviation from the normal. Freak. Five furry... What was that line? <laughs> it was the, a, for, like five furry forest freaks or something. In one of the Jordan the Barbarian stories, there's a line about freaks, which makes me think that he, he takes that as a rather deep insult. I think so. At least so much in his writing and his, you know... I feel like I've heard him say in a stream something like where... Not like he was insulting himself, but implying that if he did something, you know, untoward, that he would be a freak for doing it. But I could be wrong, but I feel like I've heard him say that word before, and it's kind of poignant. Um, Anyway... On to the next part of the origins of the word Lusitania, which we strongly suspect he's researched and connected to, um, is uh, Lissa, which is mostly a name. And this is the other Greco-Roman name slash word attributing to the etymology of Lusitania. And Lissa is a frequent figure of Greek mythology, meaning frenzy or fury and is the anthropomorphic personification of rage. She is the spirit Hera calls upon to afflict Hercules, another barbarian-like archetype, with blind, mad fury in which he murders his own wife and children. The the berserker rage. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lissa was also birthed from Uranus' blood, when he was castrated by Kratos, which is a relevant comparison to contemporary male aggression when symbolically emasculated. Likewise symbolic of Jorn's references to his inexplicable barbarian rage and destructive urges. It, it, that is Jorn's virgin with rage. That's Jorn's version of virgin with rage, our supreme gentleman. He has been emasculated by society, and he is projecting that rage in a very unhealthy way. And he's almost making light of it or celebrating it in this barbarian character in that way. Do you have any other thoughts before we move on to the curse? No. 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 Okay. So we go on to the next part, the curse. 